Welcome everyone to our Wednesday evening prayer service on behalf of Trinity Church. And I say that because of course I'm not at the church, but I'm so grateful for the technology that allows me to connect with you. Um, whether you're seeing us through Facebook or YouTube, or uh, you've gone to the website, our Trinity Church website, and clicked on the link. However you got here, I'm just glad that you're here and that we can share God's Word. You know, this evening I wanted to share from John 3 and talk about the story of Nicodemus, which talks about darkness. It takes place in the dark. It's an encounter with Nicodemus and Jesus. And, you know, it got me to thinking about darkness uh, that we might be experiencing over these last, what, six months of this global pandemic. Ah, uh, gosh, sometimes you can get up in the morning and with the very best of intentions on having a great day, and you say a prayer of thanksgiving to God in the morning, and by noon, maybe you're starting to feel kind of dragged down. Has that ever happened to you? I can tell you uh, most assuredly it's happened to me. It's like the world, which in many ways is so dark right now because of all the fear uh, over the pandemic. It's like the world just sort of creeps in and just keeps pushing and pushing that darkness and making us feel dark, making me feel dark. And that's when it is so helpful for me to remember, uh, especially as we look at Nicodemus, to remember those times of darkness and how Christ can dispel all that darkness with his light. That is so promising to me. And that is something, especially during this time of crisis, that, gosh, I've got to hang on to that. And that's my prayer for you, too, is that, you know, we can hang on to every bit of light we get. Not only can we hang on to it, but can we be faithful enough to hang on to it and share it with others, to, to spread those seeds of light? That's the challenge before us, and we learn a lot, I think, in John 3 as we look at how Nicodemus went to Jesus. So I would invite you to get your Bible and turn to John 3, and we will share in the story of Nicodemus who visits Jesus at night. I will be the first to admit that sometimes I really enjoy the darkness take the middle of the night if I wake up and can't get back to sleep. It's peaceful to me to be able to get up and go in another room of the house and sit and read, sit and pray, whatever it is. It's just there's a peaceful quality sometimes to that middle of the night. Um, same thing if it's raining. If it's pouring buckets outside and I don't have to be out in it, uh, and I can come in the house and don't have any work to do, that's really peaceful. Just to, you know, it, it's secure somehow. Just to know that it's doing, nature's doing its thing out there, but I don't have to be in it, right? And snow, same thing with snow. If I don't have to be out in it, I'm, I'm just as content to watch the dark sky spitting out this snow and just stay inside. Darkness, though, comes in a lot of different forms. And, of course, there's emotional darkness. And I've had those times uh, where it's just, yeah, it's like a weight. Uh, it's like just something dragging me down. It's just, you know, you just can't get past it. Do you know what I mean? I wonder if you've had periods uh, like that, too. Um, sometimes the darkness just seems like a, like a wall, a barrier, or, you know, just a big stumbling block in the road. Thankfully, thankfully, those dissipate. Um, yeah, I, I think in my case, I've somehow been able to just persevere until I can sense, you know, that little sliver or seed of God's light and grab hold of that and be reminded that I'm not alone, and then I'm not really in the darkness. And that's such a blessing. Um, 
I think back to times when I've observed other people's darkness, uh, emotional and spiritual darkness, and that really tugs in my heart. Uh, when I was doing chaplaincy work at Baptist Hospital, I remember um, a call that I got. I was on call that evening, and um, that meant, by the way, that I was the only chaplain on call uh, for a hospital that has close to 900 beds, and, I, you know, I love it. I loved being alone, uh, as so to speak. I loved being the only chaplain going through that hospital. We all know that the hospital never closes down. It, it ebbs and it flows, I think, throughout the day and the night, but it never completely shuts down. But nonetheless, it seemed very soothing to me to, to be walking through these halls that, you know, just a few hours earlier were just packed. But anyway, all that to say, this one particular night, I got a call uh, to a floor that I really hadn't done much visiting on, and I wasn't familiar with the patient either. Um, as it turned out, a friend of mine uh, had tended to her, talked with her during the day, that day. Uh, but I didn't know her. And so I went up to her floor, and immediately I noticed things were a little bit different because her door was just about shut, just a little, little, um, a little bit of light shining through. And uh, I knocked on the door and announced myself, and uh, she told me to come on in. And I said, you know, you don't have a lot of light. Should I turn the light on? And she said, no, absolutely not. And as it turned out, uh, this woman had been uh, in a really bad car accident and had been very badly disfigured. She laid in the bed on her side facing the wall, and I couldn't see her face. I really couldn't see much of her at all. Um, and she even asked me to shut the door as far as it could go uh, to block the light. So I took a chair and sat at the foot of her bed and, and just sat and looked at the door, the closed door, and started to talk with her. And my heart just wept, really, as she told me all the details of her accident. She told me um, how she was feeling uh, physically, you know, in terms of, of um, you know, what had happened to her. And she also told me her prognosis. So she laid out all these facts for me. And I took them all in and listened to her. And then she went on to tell me her heart. And that's, that was so moving. It was obviously painful for her to recount to me how she was feeling, uh, she, obviously depressed. Um, and then she got to a spiritual uh, way of speaking. She started sharing with me that she really didn't feel like God was watching over her. She felt like she was confused. She said, I, you know, I grew up believing in God. I believe in God. But I just don't feel like God believes in me. Wow, uh, that's hard to hear. And as I said, my heart just went out to her. And she sat and, and poured out her heart. I was so glad that I could be there to receive it. And in the darkness, after she had finished, I did what I could do, the only thing that I could do. And that was assure her that even though she didn't feel like it, even though she couldn't grasp onto it, that God was with her. And most assuredly, God loved her. And God was not going to let anything happen to her. Um, granted, she had been in this horrible car accident, but God was going to carry her. I assured her that there was light in the darkness and that that light was Jesus Christ. She understood. She told me she understood. We probably talked for an hour or more, which is a long call for a chaplaincy call. I didn't mind one bit. I would have stayed longer if I could have. But gosh, I mean, to hear someone who is in so much distress and pain, uh, it is a blessing and a gift from God to be able to share light when someone else is in that darkness. And I wish I could say that I knew that that, that one visit with me and, and hearing what God was putting in my heart to tell her just saved the day. 
But the truth is, I never saw her again. I don't know that. I want to wish that God's Word came through me and helped her. But, you know, usually in chaplaincy work, you hardly ever see the same person more than a couple of times. And she had been transferred to another unit the next day. I never saw her again, but I do want to believe that God reached out to her using me. I want to believe that she saw the light and that she felt the light. And that brings us to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, of course, was a very smart man. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, very well educated, very well schooled in the scriptures. Um, he was a public figure, essentially, too. Uh, he was part of the Sanhedrin, so he was part of the ruling court. Um, you know, it must have taken a lot for him to go to Jesus, period, uh, let alone go to him in the dark. And as we look at the scripture, we discover a lot of reasons, um, you know, why, or, or else we can posit a lot of reasons why he may have done just that, why he went to Jesus in the dark. So let's turn now um, to John chapter 3, and we'll start with verse 1 and go through 16. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they're old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born both of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you can't tell where it's coming from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe me. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So, as I said, you know, we can see uh, who Nicodemus is in terms of the world. You know, he's, he's all these things. He's, you know, this learned man. Um, but he comes to Jesus at night. Now, why would he do that? Um, we could give him the benefit of the doubt. We could say, well, he was busy during the day. Could have been. Uh, we could say that maybe the crowds that tended to follow Jesus uh, would be dispersed at, at night. You know, maybe they would have gone home and Jesus would have been more easy to approach and, and talk to. But, and this is kind of the reason that I suspect, since Nicodemus was so much of a figurehead in the political world then, he didn't want to be seen asking something that he didn't know the answer to. Um, he was probably embarrassed, uh, intimidated, uh, afraid. But I think he was curious, too. I really think he was curious because he heard about Jesus. He wanted to know more. Um, I think he went to Jesus, too, uh, you know, teacher to teacher, rabbi to rabbi. Uh, remember, uh, Nicodemus knew the Hebrew scriptures. He knew about God, but he didn't know about Jesus. He surely didn't realize 
that standing in front of him that night was God incarnate. He didn't understand that Jesus was a fulfillment of the law and that through Jesus we have the Trinity. He didn't understand those things. He didn't understand God the Father and Jesus the Son and the Holy Spirit, the embodiment of grace. He didn't understand those things because he was stuck on the law. And so Jesus answers him in a very simple way. Jesus says, uh, he knows Nicodemus knows about God, and so he says, you can't be a part of the kingdom of God unless you're first born again. Now, it's kind of a dramatic moment, I think, here in this passage of Scripture, because Nicodemus says, well, how on earth can a person do that? He's still stuck in the law, but he has the opportunity to get unstuck, and I think he knows this. Um, because this is where the truth is brought out into the light. Jesus tells him about the power of being born again spiritually. Not through human power, but through the power of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit. He says that flesh gives birth to flesh. That much Nicodemus can understand. But he also says that the greater grace here is that the Holy Spirit gives birth, a whole new life to spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit makes these inroads into our lives that we can't possibly do. And what's more, it's always present. The Holy Spirit is always working in us and through us. And I think at this point, when Jesus is relating this to Nicodemus, Nicodemus just must have become confounded. Um, you know, he didn't know what to think. Jesus appeals again, though, to the rabbinical side of Nicodemus. He talks about Moses lifting up the snake in the wilderness. Remember that? The snake on the staff? And he likens this to himself, the Son of Man, being lifted up. You see, Jesus is trying through the Hebrew Scriptures to get to Nicodemus's heart. But those words that Jesus speaks in verse 16... Oh, those are, those are special to me, and I suspect to you too. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, his only begotten Son, as we've learned it um, at other times in our lives maybe, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I would guess that for, for most of us, these are some of the, the earliest words we've heard from the Bible. Maybe it was a Sunday school teacher or a sibling or our parents. But, you know, I remember hearing those words a long time ago. And just really, you know, when I was old enough to understand, oh gosh, the meaning here. And that's what Jesus tells Nicodemus. He's really trying to appeal to him uh, and get to his heart. You know, being born again and believing in God, um, they go hand in hand. Um, you've really got to be born again to um, enter into that kingdom of God that Jesus is talking about. And what that means really is a continual turning from sin. Uh, it's a continual practice of giving up our ways in exchange for God's ways and following um, the path that God lays out for us, not the path that we create for ourselves. Um, a spiritual rebirth also is not just a quick fix to, you know, some spiritual problem we might have, but it's a cure. It's a spiritual cure. It allows us to open up and to experience joy and light and life um, with Christ. It, it allows us to, to enter into that reality, and it is a reality. The Pharisees were such legalists that they'd cut themselves off from any possibility other than what they believed and what they practiced and what they wrote and what their laws were. And, you know, I think that's a sad state of affairs. You know, people come to Christ at all ages and stages of their lives, and that's grace. That is grace. The beauty of this, 
being able to be spiritually spiritually reborn. The beauty of this is that it can happen at any time. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter who you've been. God's grace covers us and God's grace compels us to be spiritually reborn. You know, once we give our, our die to ourselves, uh, let me put it that way. Once we give ourselves up and die to our earthly form here on earth while we're still alive, that's a spiritual rebirth. And that dying to self is not a physical death. Of course it's not. It means that we give up our old ways and that we surrender to God in all ways. That's a spiritual rebirth. You know, that's grace too. And one of the best things about God's grace is that we don't have to be embarrassed. We don't have to be ashamed of who we are or who we were or what we've done or who we've known. We don't have to be too proud or, or too embarrassed to admit anything to God. We can tell everything to God and God's grace is there. We can confess everything to God. And God's grace is there. God is with us all the time, whether it's 2 a.m., whether it's high noon. God is always there. And God's light is always there. And that's what Jesus is really bringing forward when he tells, that, tells Nicodemus that everyone who believes may have eternal life in God. Now, after this encounter, and this is John 3, after this encounter with Jesus, we don't really hear a whole lot about Nicodemus. Um, there are two more instances in John's gospel where we hear about him. And the first is in John 7. Um, and Jesus is teaching at the festival of um, tabernacles. And by now, the Pharisees are getting stirred up. You know, they, they've heard a lot about Jesus. They're getting these reports in, and they don't like it. They're really starting to think that Jesus is going to interfere with what they're trying to do. And what do they want to do? Well, they want to haul him in and lock him up. And uh, Nicodemus hears about this, and he argues in Jesus' defense. Uh, if you go to verse 50 of John 7, it says, Nicodemus who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, uh, the Pharisees that is, asked, does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he's been doing? So he's standing up for Jesus, in other words. He wants Jesus to have a fair trial should the Pharisees bring him in. Then again, in John 19, we hear another report of Nicodemus. And this is the one that really moves my heart. This is the one that really touches me uh, because Jesus has been crucified. So in John 19, verse 38, it says, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. I really want to believe that Nicodemus made that spiritual turn that, that as a result of that meeting in the dark with Jesus, he surrendered to God. He surrendered to Christ. And he felt the Holy Spirit moving upon him and through him. I really want to believe that he was born again. And if not publicly, well, at least within his heart. But if he hadn't made his heart known publicly before Jesus died, he was bold to do so afterwards. The grace of God it really was with him when he went with Joseph to tend to Jesus' body. Um, it is such a moving and compelling story. It really, really says to me that he had to have been born again. Being born again, too, uh, is not just once and done. And as I hinted at earlier, um, 
knowing that we can approach God with anything at any time. We need to do it. Um, you know, experiencing uh, that turning, that's something that we've got to stay on top of. We have got to make sure that we are always at one with God. We've got to make sure that we are continually um, confessing our sins to God and asking for God's grace and asking for spiritual reform and asking to be spiritually reborn. That's how God's grace works with us. Um, it helps us to loosen our hold on our plans and give ourselves freely to God. And that's what we need to do in order to uh, give God our hearts. I'm convinced that God wants our whole hearts too. God doesn't want just a little teeny part. He doesn't just want our hearts on Tuesdays and Wednesdays or Thursdays. God wants us all the time. He wants our hearts and he wants to reach our hearts all the time. And he wants to fill our hearts with the Holy Spirit. You know, I believe that um, the story with Nicodemus, you know, it, reading of that encounter in the darkness and then much later reading about how Nicodemus tended to Jesus after Jesus had died, that speaks to me and it tells me that even the hardest, most legalistic heart can be turned and that spiritual rebirth is a possibility in everyone everyone. If it happened with Nicodemus, it can happen with all of us. There's hope and there's grace for all of us. And thanks be to God for that. And you know, there's another piece to this story. And again, we don't know if Nicodemus did this or not, but we certainly know as Christ followers that it's so important for us to carry the gospel with us wherever we go. It is so important for us to know that when we receive that light and that life through Jesus Christ, that when the darkness is dispelled, it is our task to carry this to other people. It's our task to carry it to people within our own, within our own community, but also to the ends of the earth. It is so important that we don't just sit on God's grace but that we let other people know about it. When people we know are hurting emotionally, find that, help them find that little sliver of light and, and bring it forward and expand it so that they're once again connected with God and they can feel God's light. The same thing with people who are in our community. Pray. Pray for the people in our world. We have got to take advantage of every chance that we can uh, these days, uh, pandemic or not, we've got to make sure that God's light and God's life are, are shared with the world. We've got to make it known that spiritual rebirth is a possibility and it is a reality for everyone who believes. And so this evening, I, I would compel you, I would urge you to spend some time in prayer and ask God, what can I do? What can I do, God, given your grace and given your light? What can I do to be in service to you so that I can help others be spiritually reborn? I'm glad we were able to spend this time together this evening and revisit that story of Nicodemus and think about how it must have felt for him to let down his guard. Even though he went in the night before Jesus, he still got a great lesson. And it's one that I like to think lasted him through his life. Would you pray with me before we close? Almighty God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for every day. God, we are so blessed that you love us so much and that your grace is always upon us and that your Holy Spirit moves within us and through us and guides us. 
Now thank you for the example of Nicodemus and how he really learned about spiritual rebirth, how he was able to shed some of his ways as a Pharisee and be opened and enlivened by Christ. God, may we too be enlivened by Christ each and every day. Help us, God, to lay our own agendas aside and our own plans aside so that we might hear your plan for our lives. We ask, God, too, that you would be with all of us and in many different ways. We pray, God, that, that you would safeguard our world right now. We are hurting so badly with this pandemic. God, we're confused by it. Some days we think that we might be nearing some conclusions, but other days tell us differently. And so, God, we need to lift this to you. We pray, God, that your will be done and that your hand is in this. We know that it is, Lord, but we pray for your comfort and your peace as we go through this difficult time of illness. And God, we also pray for our country. We just seem ravaged by violence and chaos. Again, these are things that many of us have just never seen, and even those of us who have. Lord, the unrest is just unbearable. We pray, God, for all of those who have lost their lives and those who are hurt in any way by the violence and the unrest. We pray, God, that you would bring it to an end. We pray, God, that you would restore our country. Please, God, may, may lives be changed in your name and may people experience a spiritual rebirth and turn to you. And God, in our, our church family, we ask that you would be with all of us. We ask that you would keep us together, closely knit. Help us, God, to lift one another up. Help us to carry each other in your name as we go through times of joy and also times of sorrow. And God, also use us, use Trinity Church as your hands and your feet in this world. Help us to, to know what your plan is for all of our lives. God, we know that we're all called to something. And we pray, God, that you would open our eyes and open our hearts so that we would be aware and so that we can carry your love into this world. And again, God, we thank you. Above all, we thank you. God, we love you. We are so grateful for your grace and for your Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we pray all of these things in your name. Amen. Friends, I'll see you next week. And in the meantime, stay safe and stay healthy and stay connected to God.